Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. For this, the 50th podcast episode of this show, we are joined by Dr. Oscar Ellick from the University of California, Santa Cruz. We'll be discussing his work seeking to understand the cosmic web, the largest structures in the universe, through computer modeling and humble slime mold. And we're also going to take a look at the future of farming on Mars, as a new study examines how to turn Martian topsoil into a fertile growing medium for Martian colonists of the future. We will examine the origin of water on planets and find clues to the chemistry of the early solar system in a Martian meteorite. And in the dark recesses of the early solar system, we see an ancient ice planet that may have forever shaped our family of planets before heading out to the void of space. Farming on Mars will require developing means to turn the ruddy Martian surface into a growing medium suitable for crops. A new study from researchers at the University of Georgia examines methods to turn the iron-rich crust of Mars into material suitable for use in Martian greenhouses of the future. SpaceX has ambitious plans to place one million inhabitants on the surface of Mars by the year 2050. Next week on this show, we'll talk with Laura Fackrell, geochemist at the University of Georgia, discussing her work developing farms for Mars designed to feed interplanetary colonists. The origin of water on planets, including Mars and the Earth, is one of the great questions in planetary science today. Did most of this water come from chemical reactions or impacts from comets? Analysis of a Martian meteorite called NWA 7533 reveals Mars likely had water 4.4 billion years ago soon after the formation of the solar system. Researchers at the University of Tokyo found evidence showing water was produced through chemical processes on the red planet at this time. These reactions would have released large quantities of hydrogen, warming the carbon dioxide rich atmosphere of Mars. However, Mars lost most of its atmosphere and water several hundred million years later turning that world into the frozen tundra we see today. A new study from Carnegie Institution shows our solar system may have included a massive ice planet orbiting between Saturn and Uranus in its earliest era. This planet would have altered the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, changing the timing of their orbits around the Sun relative to each other. This new study could assist astronomers seeking to learn more about planetary systems around other stars. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we talk to you, Dr. Oscar Ellick from the University of California, Santa Cruz, about his work understanding the cosmic web, the largest structures in the universe, through computer modeling and everyday slime mold. Hey 
This week on Astronomy News, The Cosmic Companion, we're joined by Oscar Ellick. He is a postdoctoral researcher at UC Santa Cruz, and he's been doing some fascinating work on studying the cosmic web. Welcome to the show, Oscar. Thank you, James. Happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about your work and what it is that you've been studying? Okay, so my work is in uh, computational modeling and visualization. So uh, it's not actually core astronomy, but I've been working with astronomers since I came to UC Santa Cruz, which was um, a year and a half ago. And that's especially uh, Joseph Burchett, who's a uh, postdoctoral, uh, postdoctoral researcher here as well. And he's actually starting at the New Mexico State University next year, I think. So he's an expert on um, galactic environments, galactic evolution, and kind of the, the um, circumgalactic and intergalactic medium. Uh, so yeah, he's been, he's been an inspiration fielding with interesting problems. And one of those problems has been reconstructing the cosmic web, which uh, you actually cover, James, in uh, March, I think. Okay. Um, so that was our, our first uh, study together. And yeah, since then, we've been just up to applying our, our modeling methodology to different things um, and just expanding what is, what is possible. So, so what, what inspired this study? How did it start? Well, uh, started with a completely random connection between the the huge structures of the cosmic web and the the microscopic organism known as the uh, Physarum polycephalum, the slime mold, and we just we were just um, really surprised how the the patterns that the organism actually creates by the by the, its own growth and, and just kind of searching for food in the environment, how those patterns really, really uh, resemble the cosmic web. And so we asked the question, you know, is there any connection between these two things? And so, well, how do you test such a, such a question? So as a, as a computational scientist, what I do is I develop a model and then if that model applies to the phenomenon uh, that we are looking at, um, then it's probably connected somehow. And so that's what we, what we did. Um, so we developed a model to actually take galaxies or dark matter halos, but galaxies by default as kind of like an input, uh, you could say almost like food, and then uh, feed this virtual model the galaxies. And what the model does is, well, it mimics the behavior of the Physar and Polycephalum, and it tries to kind of interconnect it with this, this web of, of filaments, uh, of connections. And there really seems to be a um, more fundamental connection than just this superficial similarity. Um, so we are, we are asking why that is, and I don't think it's a concluded question yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the lead is that basically the cosmic web is this, this network-like structure which feeds gas from galaxy to galaxy, right? It, it channels matter across the universe. And it, it functions as a transport network. You know, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not that different from road networks that we built uh, as people or, um, you know, electrical networks. So things where you need to interconnect many things in the environment or in, in space uh, and do it as efficiently as possible. And that's what the organism does as well because um, it tries to actually reach as much food in the environment with its own body mass and, and just interconnect them together into this one like amazing mesh, mesh of tubes. So yeah, we believe this is the connection and just working hard to, to show more evidence for it. Absolutely, so is the, do you think that the connection um, between the cosmic web and this 
slime mold is um, a fundamental, a look at the fundamental um, nature of nature, so to speak. Uh, is is this based on you know fractals? Is this you know self organizing mechanism in both cases? What is the what is the underlying natural connection? Yeah, it's a that's a very good question. I mean, the fractalness of the network is like is very apparent, right? Um, the cosmic web seems to be a fractal on about two to three scales of magnitude, so. It's not a perfect fractal, but it's definitely a good uh, approximation of one. Um, nothing in nature really is a perfect fractal, but is approximations of fractals. Um, I mean, fractals are just a mathematical abstraction in the end. The, I think what's a very core principle in nature that we find anywhere, I mean, you just take a stroll in the forest and, and it just jumps on you is that things follow this this principle of, of least effort so basically mm. how can i how can i optimize for for something uh in my environment um trees optimize for for optimally covering you know the space with, with leaves to capture as much sound energy um rivers optimize just for the shortest distance to the ocean or to, to a lake or wherever they, they kind of flow into. So it seems like a very universal principle. Even we people, right? You, we, we apply this principle without really thinking about it too much. You're going to work or you're driving somewhere, you pick the fastest route. I mean, okay. unless there is a very scenic alternative somewhere. But then, <laughs> you know, the cost function changes for you. And the slime mode really does just the same. It survived because it learns to optimize its body shape to actually really make use of the environment where it lives. So I think this is the universal connection that what the universe does is very hard to say. Um, but it's definitely very uncanny that it resembles all this optimal transport networks so and how do galaxies relate to the cosmic web and where did you learn about their positions and their interactions within it so the galaxies they they are kind of the nodes of the web they you know the they're almost like cities in the in the road network you know they um they create um, outflows of gas, but also um, kind of suck it in. So they basically are like um, like little windmills that that you know take energy or produce energy, but in this case it's gas. Um, you have individual like isolated galaxies uh, in the middle of voids, which are you know connected with really very thin filaments to the rest of the, the network. <clears throat> but you also have thousands of galaxies in these in these mega clusters that, that really concentrate a lot of the gas. And there is a lot of interesting, you know, thermodynamical uh, activity and, and flow going on. So they're they're kind of I think they're kind of fueling the whole network and, and keep it dynamic, you know, keep it from collapsing for instance. Um, so they definitely have an active role in how how the network looks and probably evolves in time hmm. and speaking of which perfect you should mention that <clears throat> what is your um what is your impression of how these um biological networks like the slime mold or also just you know thinking of mycelial networks you know fungi mm -hmm. un underground seem to have um, on the surface seem to have a similar structure. How, how do those evolve over time versus how the, what we know of how the cosmic web evolved over time? Yeah, I think uh, there the, the evolution looks a bit different. Um, 
because the cosmic web it's kind of it didn't grow out of a single place i mean you could say it does because it it originated at probably a very concentrated uh you know point of, of mass or, or cluster of mass that uh, expanded but it kind of grew everywhere in the same manner you know the it, the basically the combined expansion of the universe and the fact that gravity shrinks everything or it, it kind of pulls everything together i think the structure that we see today is um, mainly the result of these two kind of competing forces the the expansion and the contraction um whereas you know something like slime mold or mycelium they they grow from a single point of origin and then they kind of explore the environment they grow into the environment mm. so it's not like that you have like a like a proto mycelium everywhere and then it condenses into the filament it's more like they they you know explore the environment so there's definitely a point where these two uh, structures differ um but the question is whether they they behave similar in a similar way on this kind of high level when you really look at it as a as a as a thing as a network as a whole um does you know does the dynamic of the of each of the systems kind of follow similar rules and you know that that was the idea which we applied in this this modeling approach um getting inspired by the slime mold organism and fitting it to the universe all right all right and um <clears throat> so what does this teach us about dark matter and how does dark matter interact with 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 your studies listen you know that's very hard to say for sure because we don't yet know what dark matter is um we we definitely have a lot of assumptions about it um what dark matter seems to be is is kind of a scaffolding for for everything um the the current theoretical predictions are that uh, you know we have five times as much dark matter as as baryonic matter so the the classical conventional matter um you know give or take five times mm -hmm. but if that's true it means that the universe is gravitationally uh, dominated by the dark matter and so um it it basically creates the supporting structure for the filaments to kind of flow around almost. Um, so in the studies that we've done with, with Joe Burchett, uh, we, we took this approach that we actually calibrated our model on the distribution of dark matter, uh, which obviously we don't know in the real universe, but we know from simulations. So whenever you have, you know, a large scale uh, simulation like illustries or Bolshoi Plank or, or Eagle, um, these simulations have to consider the distribution of dark matter to actually get a plausible looking universe. And so you can then take this distribution from the simulation and look at it in like in isolation. And so the first experiments we did with our, uh, with our FISARO model was on simulated distribution of dark matter. And the assumption is that this distribution then matches the distribution of the the conventional matter, the baryons in the universe. And so, once you know how to describe, you know how to how to actually quantify the dark matter part, you have a very good clue about the 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 other matter that we cannot also observe, but at least we see the nodes of it, which are the galaxies. So there is a sort of transfer of, of knowledge, transfer of patterns from one to the other. So what are you, what are you working on now? What are your, where are your studies headed? So we, we recently finished a study where we applied the, the same model to study um, an event called a flash radio burst. So um, I'm, I don't know if that rings a bell. It's a- Of course. Okay, so it's a, so for the for the audience, this is a relatively new phenomenon, and it's basically these very fast 
pulses of energy that originate somewhere. Uh, the we don't even know where exactly. Um, is assumed that certain kinds of stars emit them, and we we did a study of one such event that originated about uh, at the, the redshift at, at point one, I think, which is not too far from us, uh, but far enough so that between us and the event, uh, which happened in another galaxy, there is a you know significant amount of uh, cosmic web uh, kind of intervening. And so we actually used our model in um, in studying how much of the cosmic web might there be between us and that host galaxy where we observe the, the flash uh, radio burst. And um, in a paper that we published recently, we actually found evidence that the cosmic web really is much denser between us and this event than you would expect on average. And that's what leads to an increased um, kind of dispersion of this signal. So when this flash radio burst travels towards us, it actually gets um, dispersed, it gets scattered or absorbed by the, the matter that's between us. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the, this FISARO model, we actually could quantify how much of this matter should we expect between us and the event um, as a function of all the galaxies that, that are uh, kind of around the, the traveling path of the light. So that was really interesting to actually see that, you know, we can explain real phenomena which, which were measured and were unexplained by just purely the contribution of the galaxies. So there was something extra that was needed. And um, it seems that we managed to actually find it. Yeah, um, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to move on to another thing. All right. And um, so what else do we need to know about, about this wonderful connection between between slime mold and, and <laughs> the grandest scale of the universe? What else do we need to know? Um, well, we definitely will continue working on this because it's it's fascinating. I mean, the like as a as a scientist, I am definitely inspired by just connections between things in the universe, how how kind of the pieces of the puzzle fall together, and you know sometimes you have these these really difficult theoretical problems that are hard to explain from the ground up. Uh, by just using pure physics. So what I really, you know, will strive in the following years is to actually um, really pave a way towards a model that can be universally used to explain phenomena like this. Um, so that's the computational or the modeling side of things rather than the astronomical one. And of course, you know, we as a, as a group hope to work together to actually continue applying this model to um, to just astronomical problems. Um, we recently uh, finished a study which was supposed to visualize, or which the purpose of which was to visualize the data from the newest uh, kind of cosmological simulation called Illustris TNG. And actually we're trying to explain things like do galaxies know about their position in the cosmic web? So it's something that, you know, sounds like a very strangely posed question, but um, in reality, you know, we really observe that different kinds of galaxies lie in different places in the cosmic web. I mean, James, you asked about uh, where do galaxies kind of fall in, in the structure, and really we see that in the nodes, in the, the clusters, where all the cosmic web filaments kind of converge together, the galaxies tend to be different. Um, they usually are bigger and heavier, which you would expect, you know, when all these things, all these filaments come together. But they also tend to be depleted of their, uh, their gas supply. So what it means in uh, astronomical terms is that their star formation rate is actually kind of uh, low 
even in the sense that they are uh, they are on they're kind of like in the old age of being a galaxy. So more stars are dying in these galaxies than more new ones are born, which is fascinating because it suggests that galaxies actually have a lifetime on their own and and like a life cycle. They are there are young galaxies and they're old galaxies. So we really hope to find uh, more about about how do these things relate? How does the cosmic web and the galaxy's position in it actually relate to the galaxy itself and to its lifetime? And who knows, maybe we learn something about humans too. Mm -hmm. Our lives. That's fabulous. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's, My great, pleasure. Having you. it's great talking with you, Oscar. <clears throat> and thank that was uh, Oscar Ellick, postdoctoral researcher at UC Santa Cruz. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we will talk with Laura Fackrell, geochemist at the University of Georgia, discussing her work developing farms for Mars to feed interplanetary colonists of the future. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. We depend on support from viewers just like you. To help support this program with a one-time donation or a paid subscription starting at just 99 cents a month, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.